Okay, this is the second part of our talk on distal femur fractures. This is the Orthopedic Trauma Association Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 3. I'm Saki Brahman. I'm narrating. This is a PowerPoint slideshow by Dr. Christ and uh, contributions from previous authors before him. Um, and in the first portion of the slideshow, mostly went through assessment. Um, a lot about um, fracture classification, use of the AO classification. Remember, um, uh, periarticular 33A uh, will be extra articular, B is partial articular, and C is a complete articular. Uh, we talked about um, uh, preoperative planning and uh, the different types of devices uh, that you might have to use. Uh, and a lot about the anatomy of the distal femur, very important, as well as the deforming forces to understand how to treat these, and a little bit about external fixation. So let's get into the internal fixation options, and um, uh, you know, which I mentioned are mostly going to be locked plates and and nails, but we'll talk about a few other options that are out there, uh, somewhat older techniques, and. Certainly around the world, um, these may be techniques that uh, maybe are more commonly used than where I am. But um, these include condylar buttress plates. Um, and when I say that, uh, I essentially mean non-locked condylar buttress plates. Uh, there are fixed angle devices, such as the condylar blade, um, the dynamic condylar screw, um, uh, which is, um, well, we'll show you what that is if you have not uh, used or seen that. And then... Um, different types of locked plates. Uh, and then there are essentially retrograde intramedullary nails. Um, and um, the point is all implants can can work if utilized properly. Some plates are a little bit, uh, I'm sorry, some devices are a little bit more versatile than others and others have more narrow indications. So we'll get into that. So before even getting into that, um, prior to applying implants, it's, it's really important that you reduce the fracture. And this is Probably the, the most challenging part of these cases is understanding how to overcome the deforming forces, understanding the anatomy. So we spent a lot of time on that, and that helps you to understand how to reduce the fracture. Um, keep in mind that the internal fixation implants typically will not reduce the fracture. Now they may aid in reduction if you have a properly contoured implant and use um, cortical screws, for instance, uh, you can certainly use plates as an aid to help with the reduction, but um, you can't count on that. Um, and certainly distal femur, I think you have to sort of physically obtain the uh, reduction either with direct or indirect methods. So here's an example you can see. Um, factor's been fixed, but there's some there's some angulation here and the uh, distal femur has been extended because those forces weren't completely overcome. So respect to biology, um, indirect reduction, and this is from an old uh, AO uh, textbook, uh, the you know, AO manual, uh, I believe, or from uh, Dr. Mast's um, uh, text on planning and reduction techniques in fracture surgery. But um, uh, the, the, here you can see uh, you've got a, a distractor, uh, in place, that's an indirect reduction technique. Um, you have a clamp on here, and it's coming from the medial side, so it's definitely not indirect. Um, you can see the use of uh, a dental pick to sort of gently bring some of the medial fragments into place while still maintaining, you can see some of their uh, muscular attachments, so that, that would be considered indirect re reduction technique. Uh, you can also use uh, uh, pins as joysticks, percutaneous clamps, bumps. This is particularly helpful uh, to overcome the uh, pull of the gastrocnemius, for instance. Here's an example of uh, indirect reduction, right? So you have a distractor in place, you have a bump under the knee, um, and uh, trying to at least uh, do your best to respect the biology in, in the area where you don't need to do a lot of work, right, along the mid-thigh, you don't necessarily have to open and elevate all that muscle. Whereas distally, uh, where you need to see the joint, you need to um, potentially get your reduction or um, at least visualize um, some of the crucial portions of the plate, you have that part open. So 
with an external fixator in place, for instance, that can help with indirect reduction and traction. A bump would typically need to be placed right about here to overcome uh, the angulation that uh, you typically experience with a distal femur fracture. So hyperextension deformities are very difficult to control with um, just a knee spanning X fix. Um, you can try using um, uh, distal anterior to posterior half pins as a joystick, uh, or to, to, to you know to or just you know build to the frame. Uh, here you can see an example of before and after of um, uh, a pin placed in the distal segment. Um, and then sort of using that as a reduction aid uh, to improve your fracture alignment. And you can see here also there's been the use of a little um, mini fragment plate in there to sort of help with uh, at least one of the major fragments. Limit your soft tissue dissection, respect the biology, um, use indirect reduction techniques where you can, especially in the metaphyseal and metadiaphyseal areas where uh, as um, in the articular fragments you typically need direct reduction techniques. Uh, the plate can often be placed in a submuscular uh, fashion and that can help to preserve the periosteal blood supply. This is some older uh, data from um, presumably I believe from Hanover and Christian Credick's uh, lab showing how the, um, the uh, blood supply both uh, Periosteal and endosteal blood supply can be uh, preserved with, um, or at least less injured uh, than with conventional open plating. So, um, which implant? Well, you've got all these different choices, and uh, we'll start with uh, retrograde nails. So, one of the advantages of the retrograde nail is that it is, um, it's typically typically placed through a smaller incision, okay? So um, to some degree, it's, it's, you know, nails in general are the uh, sort of natural minimally invasive technique. Um, there's no muscle stripping at all, right? Uh, um, there's uh, smaller incisions. You have uh, potential percutaneous joint fixation. Um, uh, you have uh, limited exposure, you have uh, potentially decreased blood loss, although a lot of the blood loss you just may not see because uh, it's happening under the skin. Um, you know, to some degree, it's a load-sharing device and it has a long, longer lever arm um, and the soft tissues uh, can remain intact for the most part. Disadvantages are um, you have to do an arthrotomy in, in every single case, which, uh, you know, um, uh, which and you have to literally just put a hole right in the distal femur. Um, you have percutaneous joint fixation, which may not necessarily be advantageous in your particular case. Um, you do sort of have this lack of alignment control. And any of you who've been in these cases, you may have seen this, where you're fixing a small implant into a very wide canal. I'll try to go over this when we get one of the x-rays up. But you can get this windshield wiper effect. That is, uh, or maybe it's just worth drawing uh, really quickly. So, you know, you have a distal femur and you have this, you know, this really narrow rod in there. Let's just say it's something like this. And, um, you know, you've got a fracture that's at this, sorry, it's at this level, right? So um, if your screws, whoops. If your screws are um, something like this, and the fracture's up here, there's all this wiggle room, right, for the rod to move back and forth. And sometimes you can literally get this windshield wiper effect to some degree, even though you have these screws here. And what you try to do is you limit this to some degree by having better fixation in this distal fragment. But typically, they're not going to be the same as having like a locked plate here. So you can get this sort of windshield wipering and of course the whole fracture can windshield wiper with it uh, and this can be mitigated potentially by having by having blocking screws here and here um, you know or here and here to sort of uh, create new cortices but um, but this is important to recognize uh, with the distal femur um, 
if you have a total knee, sometimes it can be difficult to, uh, we, we don't, we're not going to get too much into periprosthetic fractures here, um, but there are more limitations with a retrograde nail when you have a, a total knee arthroplasty. Like I kept, keep harping on, don't forget to reduce the fracture first. The nail typically will not assist you with this, okay? And, 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 and as opposed to a mid-shaft fracture where you get an isthmus fit and then the, the fracture kind of reduces, the rod in the supracondylar region will not do this for you. And I kind of, you know, in the last picture, you, you can see why that's the case. It's just the, the rod is so much narrower than the, the actual width of the, of the canal at that level. Uh, and as I showed you, blocking or polar screws could be used to create a false cortex and make the metaphyseal fit of the nail better. We'll go over this. Uh, the nail will, um, unfortunately, lock a fracture into malreduced position as easily as it will lock it reduced, like with any implant. Okay, so don't forget the reduction. Um, when you're doing these, typically it's a medial peripatellar incision. You, you could split the tendon as well, but I think... Uh, most surgeons do a medial peripatellar incision and then that becomes extensile if needed um, if you need to move the whole patella out of the way which is uncommon but uh, could be needed in certain circumstances um, make sure that insert the incision is big enough to get all your instruments in um, here's uh, you know typically how you're gonna you know, get your CRM images hopefully you've got the reduction uh, you want to have a relatively central position and it's very important as you get your starting point for instance that you not only recognize you, you, know, you get a good AP x-ray you have a good central starting point here and that you recognize you know what your distal femur looks like and where you know you want to make sure that you're coming right down the middle here because there's a real strong tendency to sometimes, well maybe not that extreme, go a little bit this way or this way. So you have to zoom out, you have to hopefully get a reasonable reduction, and as you start your portal, this is really important. Now for mid-shaft fracture up here, it wouldn't matter as much, but like any extreme nailing, like a you know, nailing of a proximal third tibia fracture, it's the same thing here. You have to be really, really patient and make sure that you have um, a starting point that's right down the middle, all right? So here's a case example, 42-year-old male, 33C2 fracture, okay, so it's uh, 33, distal femur, C, complete articular, okay, and 2 is, I don't think you need to know that one too much, just that kind of tells you the degree of comminution, and got some other injury here too in the lower leg. So here you can see this was done with uh, retrograde intramedullary nailing, you can see that there are, um, uh, there are, um, so I think if you were to look at this, you would say, well, there's an intraarticular fracture line maybe there, but it's not horribly displaced, okay? Um, maybe there was a CT scan that helped to show this, or maybe you were able to convince yourself, or maybe it was noted intraoperatively, but with a minimally displaced intraarticular fracture, it still is a C-type injury. It's a complete articular injury, but... This is the case that could be treated with, you can see, uh, lag screw fixation, so the screw in front and behind the nail, so that's to, to, comp to treat the articular fracture first. Okay, so I'd say the screws are done first, okay? The nail is then done second, and maybe, I don't know where the tibia was treated in all this, but um, when you're treating and uh, 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 doing a nailing slash screw fixation of an intraarticular distal femur fracture, you always deal with the articular fracture first. It's similar to many art articular injuries. Proximal tibia would be another case, distal third tibia. Okay, here's another case, retrograde intramedullary nail. Here you can see um, the use of um, blocking pins. Okay, um, and I'm talking about particularly the uh, A to P pins. So here you can see um, blocking pins placed, uh, some sort of provisional fixation, uh, guide rod for the uh, intramedullary nail going in, reaming, and uh, you know the pins are replaced by screws. One thing I would say is, you know, with pins, you got to be a little bit careful that the pins. If you're only using pins and you know you're going in and you're reaming, 
you know, you're reaming right up against these these pins as you go in. You got to be careful. Sometimes uh, pins can migrate, and um, as the reamer is turning, turning, turning against the pin, uh, if it goes right up against the pin, it can actually sort of it's, remember it's it's turning like this next to the pin. It can sort of push the pin in like that. All right. So anywhere you place a pin and you're reaming or putting a spinning device up against, you got to be a little bit careful with that. But what this technique is showing is that you're effectively narrowing the canal. You place your guide wire centrally, and that can allow your rod to uh, not windshield wiper as much. Now that you have these two screws here, this rod is not going to want to sort of go this way and this way. Okay, it's going to bump up against those two screws, and you should be able to maintain your reduction. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about plate and screw constructs before we get into locked plates. Um, in general, plate and screw constructs have some advantages of being direct, you know, having direct visualization of the joint with fixation, uh, can help to restore your mechanical axis. Um, it certainly, with the right technique, it can have improved fixation over nails. Um, and I think even with the newer generation uh, retrograde nails, um, and I think it's worth mentioning, if you're doing a retrograde nail for a distal femur fracture, especially if the patient has poor bone, in this day and age, I think you have to use one of the techniques that, one of the implants that have um, sort of advanced locking options, right? Multiple screws, uh, maybe some type of blade device, whatever uh, device you have. Um, I think if it's poor bone, distal femur, um, and you're nailing it, uh, you want to have uh, some improved uh, locking options rather than just like, you know, two standard screws, okay? That said, even with those devices, um, some biomechanical studies, uh, and we've certainly shown this in our lab, um, still don't stand up to locked plating, uh, with, at least with regards to, uh, you know, um, rigidity of fixation distally. Disadvantages are potentially more blood loss, although with nails you just don't see the blood loss. Um, more soft tissue stripping, I think that's definitely the case compared to nailing. Um, you're, no matter how submuscular you are, you're, you're shoving a plate under the muscle. Um, so I would say that's uh, yes. Um, and uh, screw purchase and osteopenic bone um, it's still a disadvantage, but um, certainly with locked plates, it can be it can be much improved. And it's a load-bearing device. So here's some of the um, plate options you have. Um, we talked about this already. Uh, indirect reduction techniques um, should be used when possible. Um, oops. Um, sometimes you can do percutaneous or minimally invasive submuscular plating for certain fracture patterns. Sometimes it's not possible. So I think, um, for instance, uh, fractures with minimal intraarticular involvement that have, uh, or no intraarticular involvement, like type A fractures, common to supercondylars, those ones are very, very amenable to minimally invasive plating, okay? Especially if they're, you know, comminuted, for instance. Um, Indirect reduction is not for the joint surface, though, right? So joint surface, either in a type B or type C fracture, um, unless it's completely non-displaced, you need to directly visualize it, get a perfect reduction of the articular fracture lines. Um, um, uh, that said, um, when you get above the joint surface, you do try to preserve the soft tissue envelope around metadiaphyseal fracture lines. And here, you're not looking necessarily to be perfectly anatomic, but you're looking to achieve length, alignment, rotation, right? So just remember length, alignment, rotation via traction, manipulation, and you know, maybe joysticks or indirect reduction aids that don't necessarily strip everything off. So I kind of mentioned before, I mean, this sort of medial uh, clamp coming in is really not, uh, not possible. But here you can see that the the fracture site in this area is left somewhat alone with all our indirect reduction techniques. So plan ahead, right? Have a good pre-op plan. Um, remember your principles, careful handling of the soft tissues, indirect reduction techniques, 
anatomic reduction of the joint surface, restoration of um, alignment, rotation, length, stable internal fixation, and early rehab. All right, so kind of AO principles. When you plate these, you want to have incisions that are large enough to expose an anatomically reduced articular surface. Um, plates can often be placed in a submuscular fashion. And then you want to fix um, the shaft to the articular block, right? Um, overall, you want to sort of have minimal soft tissue stripping wherever possible. So what, we'll talk about the dynamic, um, dynamic condylar screw. It's somewhat of a fixed angle device, resists varus. Uh, the contour is made pretty much to sit nicely on the distal femur. It allows for some sagittal plane correction after the bolt placement. Disadvantages are um, listed poor control of sagittal plane deformity. Um, the bolt is a big, huge bolt, so there's some bone re re removal required for that when you ream and everything. And because of that, it's difficult to avoid our, um, articular lag screw traffic with the bolt, meaning like you put your lag screws in and then you get this big, huge bolt that just can't get around them. Uh, so here's an older case, AP x-ray, uh, direct reduction of the articular surface, lag screws placed. Um, now you can see that uh, guide wire is being put in for the uh, for the uh, for the DCS uh, bolt is in place. Submuscular plate application, cortical screws placed above, um, and uh, you know in this particular case you can see you know that you uh, don't necessarily have the greatest reduction. Of course, they don't always end up like this. Just an example to show some potential problems. Um, what about condylar buttress plates? Well, these are plates that are anatomically designed for the distal femur. Uh, they can be placed in a submuscular fashion. And for unicondylar fractures, like a, just a medial condyle or just a lateral condyle, they can work really well. Problem is for type C fractures or comminuted type A fractures, especially with bad bone, they don't resist varus. And um, with medial comminution, they can fail. And in the old days, you know, we used to sometimes have to use dual plates on either side to prevent that from happening. So again, they're, they're useful for this type of fracture pattern shown here, right? So just maybe a lateral condyle fracture that's not, you know, you can't just fix with only screws, maybe a medial fracture. Um, these can sit very nicely. Um, and the uh, thing is, these kind of injuries are relatively uncommon, okay? And you can see this, it's a, it's a type B fracture, um, and there's no medial fracture line at all. Um, this is not the greatest place to use it, right? It's comminuted type C or maybe it was type A fracture. Uh, and this is the type of case in the old days or if you don't have locked plates, for instance, you would have needed to put a separate plate medially. And that was a technique uh, described by Sanders to do dual plating uh, for those type of fractures. Because um, this type of implant, you know, these screws are not fixed angle and they will uh, potentially uh, you know, loosen and toggle uh, under, under stress. So the condylar blade plate is a fixed angle device. All right? um, unlike the DCS, it doesn't remove a lot of bone distally. It's anatomically contoured and it resists sagittal plane deformities. The problem is it's technically challenging. Not a lot of people know how to do it. Um, it's still difficult to avoid lag screw traffic and it's like one piece device other than the screws up top. So once it's placed, there's no ability to change position. And you gotta like sort of mallet this thing in there. So you get this nice articular reduction and then you take this this blade and you like hammer it through and you, you risk disrupting your reduction. So it's a single device, right? It's literally got this, this plate with an angle and a sharp chiseled blade on the end of it. So to be able to get it in properly, you got to get a nice reduction and you've got to get orientated in three planes. All right. Um, so requires, going back to our first session, very, very good understanding of the geometry of the distal femur. Okay, you got to make sure it doesn't enter the notch or go into the um, patellofemoral joint. You have to make sure it doesn't stick out the far side and you got to make sure also that your um, the plate doesn't go off the shaft proximally. Okay, um, here are some of the sort of uh, 
coordinates, so to speak, for appropriate placement of uh, the blade. And here you can see also where interfrag screws were placed strategically around the path of the blade. Because remember, you want to get your articular reduction first. Right, so here's where you may want to put lag screws. Um, so again, you get the joint surface first, you restore length and alignment, and then you place the blade uh, in a proper position and fix it to the shaft. And it's a non-locked plate up top. All right, so here's some indirect reduction technique, uh, intercondylar, uh, interfragmentary screws at the joint, blade bling placed, hopefully some, trying to key in some of those fragments with minimally invasive uh, technique, maybe some lag screws, and you can see then uh, neutralizing screws up on, up on the shaft over here. Okay, and that's what a case might look like with a condylar blade. All right, so I'm gonna pause here and in the last session, we're going to talk a little bit about locked plates, outcomes, and uh, wrap it up. Thanks.